of the immediate family, only the Dowager Empress Maria Fedorovna would escape the assassin's bullet. As she makes a hasty departure from her homeland, she brings with her the last Fabergé Imperial Easter egg she will ever receive from her son Nicholas, once the Tsar of all the Russias. And halfway around the world, an eccentric young heiress becomes ensnared in the notorious past of the largest known blue diamond. I think it was a case of wanting to have something that nobody else had. She couldn't have a crown, she couldn't have uh, a very nice husband, but she sure could have the Hope Diamond. Easter is the most joyful celebration of the Orthodox faith in Russia. After the devout church services, families gather to exchange gifts of decorated eggs, symbols of renewed life and hope. This Easter of 1885 also marks the 20th anniversary of Tsar Alexander III and Tsarina Maria Fedorovna, and the Tsar needs an exceptional gift for his wife. So he places an order with Peter Carl Fabergé, whose beautiful jeweled creations have recently caught Maria's eye. On Easter morning, Fabergé delivers to the palace a simple enameled egg. But to the delight of the Empress, inside is a golden yolk. And within the yolk, a golden hen. And concealed within the hen is a diamond miniature of the royal crown and a tiny ruby egg both now lost to history. His wife's pleasure is all Tsar Alexander needs to reward Fabergé with a commission for an Easter egg every year. Each must be unique and each must contain a suitable surprise for the Empress. With an inventive spirit, Fabergé repeatedly meets the challenge borrowing inspiration from the gilded lives of the Tsar and Tsarina. In Russia, near the turn of the century, the contrast between the very rich and the very poor could not be more absolute. Over 80 million peasants scratch a meager existence from the land. In the city's developing industries, working conditions are intolerable. While democratic freedoms take hold elsewhere in Europe, no constitutional restraints limit the power of the Tsar who rules by divine right. A great big bear of a man, Alexander III governs with an iron hand, determined to preserve the monarchy in the face of appeals for social reform. But after nearly 300 years of autocracy under the Romanov dynasty, Russian history is about to change. In 1894, the Tsar's health fails. He dies suddenly in the prime of life, and his son Nicholas unwillingly ascends the throne. My God, the Lord has called our deeply beloved Papa to him. My head is spinning. I am not prepared to be a Tsar. I never wanted to become one. Untrained in the business of ruling one-eighth of the world's population and purposely cut off from progressive thinking by his parents, Nicholas embraces the limited ideals of order and tradition. So to make sure that he didn't make any mistakes, he decided that the easiest course for him was to continue everything that his father had done. And he adored his father. He loved him very much. The decision applies as deliberately to the established customs within the court and family as to the affairs of state. And of course the Easter eggs was a tradition that was started by his father and Nicholas decided to carry it on. 
The 12 monograms egg is the first Fabergé egg given by Tsar Nicholas to his mother. Featuring in diamonds the royal insignia of Tsar Alexander III, Fabergé's understated creation is a fitting tribute for the mourning dowager empress. That same year, Nicholas orders a second egg to be made for his bride, the German Princess Alexandra Fedorovna. For the new Tsarina, Fabergé trims a strawberry red egg with a diamond Cupid's arrow. The surprise inside is a golden yellow rosebud, another symbol of the couple's love for one another. With the success of the rosebud egg, Fabergé turns his attention to an ambitious design for the following Easter. When Peter Carl Fabergé takes over his father's jewelry firm in 1872, it is not much different from several other workshops catering to the upper classes of St. Petersburg. But Fabergé is determined to distinguish the family name. Here uh, you see the shrewd man, the businessman. He worked for an institution called the Imperial Cabinet, which was in charge of all the treasures of the Tsars in the Hermitage. He worked there free of charge and repaired things, appraised things, and so on. Having earned the recognition of this prestigious organization by virtue of his consummate craftsmanship, Fabergé eagerly formulates a new aesthetic, which he hopes will capture the fancy of the Russian aristocracy. His feeling was that it should be creativity and, and craftsmanship rather than carrot content that dictated the appreciation of a piece. And he obviously had a wonderful sense of humor. And these caught the attention of Alexander III. And he admired these and admired the craftsmanship as examples of, of Russian genius. When the title of supplier to the court of his imperial majesty is bestowed on him in 1885, Fabergé's fame spreads throughout Europe. Once you're one of the approved suppliers to the crown, it was a very lucrative source of business. Every time the, the, the Tsar went on a visit or received another head of state, there was always an exchange of gifts. And when the Tsar and Tsarina traveled, they traveled with suitcases full of Fabergé, which were presented here and there to people in thanks. By 1896, the year of the coronation of Nicholas II, virtually all the major presents came from Fabergé. The novelty of combining artistic inspiration with functional value and a touch of whimsy is so successful that Fabergé's workshops are flooded with commissions, transforming an ordinary goldsmithing shop into the famous House of Fabergé. But though aristocrats, emperors, barons, kings and queens alike all cross his threshold seeking suitable gifts, Fabergé's first duty is always to the Tsar. Nicholas II enjoys the pomp and ritual of military life and imperial ceremony, requiring him only to look good and say little. The coronation of Nicholas and Alexandra is one of the most magnificent pageants in Russian history. Attended by over 7,000 guests from around the world, including most of Europe's royalty, the celebrations last for two weeks. Fabergé's commemorative is a precise reproduction, under four inches long, of the 18th century coach that carries Alexandra to her coronation. It was all done by hand and crafted by hand in such minute detail. Every detail from the state carriage was included. From the little uh, crown on the top of it and diamonds to the windows in uh, rock crystal. 
and the little steps when the Empress would alight from the carriage onto the steps, they would fall out of the carriage and in their little miniature they do the same. It took approximately 15 months to craft this carriage by hand, working all day and well into the night, uh, seven days a week, and barely finished it just in time to be presented to the Empress. But such extravagance stands in sharp contrast to conditions that exist outside the periphery of imperial awareness. The day after Nicholas takes the throne, half a million people gather at Kurjinko Meadow for the traditional feast given by the newly crowned Tsar for his people. When a rumor spreads that provisions are limited, the crowds surge toward the banquet tables. Thousands are killed and maimed in the crush of panic. Lacking political instinct, Nicholas is unsure how to handle the crisis. That night, on the advice of his uncles to maintain protocol, the Tsar orders the continuation of coronation festivities, offering no expression of grief to his people as they bury their dead. Though in court circles the disaster is rarely mentioned, it is regarded as a bad omen for the new reign. Nine years later, another crowd would gather at the Tsar's palace, not to celebrate, but to voice its discontent. Over the next years, Nicholas and Alexandra increasingly insulate themselves from politics and the intrigues of the court, preferring the comfortable sphere of family and life's less complicated pleasures. Fabergé makes a point of learning something of the private lives of his most important clients. He knows that in spring, Alexandra has the rooms of the palaces filled with beautiful floral bouquets. For the Tsarina, Fabergé fashions the Lilies of the Valley egg, a translucent pink enameled treasure covered with gold-stemmed flowers made of pearls, diamonds, and rubies. One flower, when turned, releases a geared mechanism inside to raise a fan of tiny miniatures from the top. Portraits of the Tsar and his first two daughters, Olga and Tatiana. As the family grows, paintings of the children become a recurring theme, and the best-loved surprises are souvenirs of family memories. The Jade Alexander Palace Egg contains a perfect replica of their favorite royal residence in the country, only two and one-half inches long. And sailing on a clear rock crystal sea, reproduced to the last detail, is their royal yacht, the Standard, where many happy days are spent together. Fabergé's object was to delight and surprise. And I think that that was where he differed so much from all the other jewelers of the period, where they were only interested in large gemstones. Carl Fabergé was interested in the ultimate effect that the piece would have, a lasting effect that every time you looked at this particular object that you would have this great sense of, of sheer enjoyment and pleasure from it. Fabergé knows both the joys and sorrows of the Romanovs. It wasn't very well known, of course, and the imperial family kept it very quiet, that the Tsarevich had hemophilia. He was dying, he was very close to death, so close that the imperial court had already written out his death notice. 
but Alexei survives and Fabergé designs a special tribute. The Zarovich egg is Alexandra's most cherished. Ironically, the man who conceives of and hand-delivers these incredible pieces has little to do with their actual fabrication. He, as the head of the firm, he had the best designers, the best goldsmiths, the best jewelers, the best stone cutters, the best miniatures, all working for him. At the height of the success of the firm, he had over 500 employees, four shops in Russia, one shop in London, and a catalog operation. He provided the taste and the direction, and he was the, the genius that got all these artists and artisans to work together to produce these incredible fantasies. Fabergé refuses to be limited by 19th century goldsmithing techniques. If methods do not exist to execute his ideas, he requires that his craftsmen invent them. In the field of enameling, they continually surpass the competition. Replacing the standard palette of colors, Fabergé produces over 140 new shades in all. With every egg, he outdoes himself in technique, detail, or complex mechanics. At the stroke of the hour, a ruby-eyed rooster emerges crowing and flapping its wings from the top of the cockerel egg. The 11-inch bay tree egg conceals tiny bellows to produce the sweet song of a feathered bird. In 1900, Fabergé devises an ingenious offering to celebrate the approaching completion of the Trans-Siberian Railway. Etched on a belt of silver is a map of the railway line. And inside, a little train just one foot long. It's made out of gold and platinum, and its headlights are diamonds, and its rear lights are rubies. And the coaches are individually labeled for gentlemen, for smoking, for ladies. There was a restaurant car, and at the end there was the traveling church, which was appended to the imperial train. It winds up, and I've tried it myself. The mechanism is a bit rusty, and it moves slowly, but it's like, like a sort of old dinky toy, if you like. But most of Russia has no time for toys. The zeal to expand the empire by linking European Russia to the Pacific coast leads to a disastrous war with Japan and further demoralizes the country. Cut off from politics and the growing unrest, Nicholas continues to oppose any political or social reforms. I shall maintain the principle of autocracy just as firmly and unflinchingly as my unforgettable late father. On Sunday, January 22, 1905, over 100,000 demonstrators march peacefully to the Winter Palace to present the Tsar with a list of complaints concerning working conditions in the factories. When the Tsar fails to appear, tension mounts. In a moment of panic, soldiers open fire on the crowd. Hundreds are killed or injured in what will become known as the Massacre of Bloody Sunday. His hand forced by the resulting outrage, Nicholas reluctantly assents to constitutional monarchy. To the peasants, the Batushka Tsar benevolent father of the Russian people has become a cruelly indifferent ruler. As if to bolster the Tsar's self-image, Fabergé presents Nicholas with a series of eggs commemorating achievements of the Romanovs. 
In lavish Rococo style, the Peter the Great Egg celebrates the 200th anniversary of the founding of St. Petersburg. The Napoleonic Egg honors the motherland's victory over the French general and his armies. In 1913, the 300 year rule of Russia under the House of Romanov is recorded in the portraits encircling the tercentenary egg. From the founder, Mikhail Fedorovich, to Catherine the Great, and Nicholas himself. The white enamel shell is nearly obscured by over 1,100 diamonds and golden symbols of royal order. The eggs of this period represent the height of Fabergé's career, expressions in miniature of the life of imperial privilege. The Grisai egg imitates palatial splendor in bas-relief scroll work and carved ivory cameos. They are the absolute summit of craftsmanship. They are unbelievably made. This is the sort of apogee of what Fabergé was able to make and he lavished everything that he could on them. But all of the elements of the Romanov story come together most elegantly in the 15th anniversary egg, a family album just over five inches tall. Exquisitely detailed paintings depict the most notable events of the reign of Nicholas II and each of the family members. Not only is it a staggering tour de force of the jeweler's art, but uh, probably more than any other egg, it is the one most intimately associated with the whole tragedy of Nicholas and Alexandra and that incredibly beautiful family. There are these five children, all these sort of glamorous events surrounding their lives, and there they are looking out at us, happily unknowing what was going to happen to them just a few years later. By 1914, Russia is at war with Germany, and at first the simmering discontent of the nation is cooled by patriotic unity in defense of Mother Russia. Manpower is virtually inexhaustible, but the Tsar's army is untrained. Arms factories are few and unproductive, and the railway lacks the capacity to carry enough supplies or even food to the soldiers at the front. In the first five months of war, Russia loses over one million men, killed, wounded, or taken prisoner. In response to the suffering of their people, the royal family converts the palaces to provisional hospitals. And Maria, Alexandra, and her two eldest daughters help to nurse the wounded. To match the sober mood of the nation, Fabergé alters the tone of the Easter gifts that year. Inside the Red Cross egg, given to Maria, are portraits of the Romanov women dressed as Sisters of Mercy. In 1915, the Tsar appoints himself supreme commander of the army, displacing one of the top generals. For this act, he is awarded the Order of St. George, given for outstanding military bravery or achievement. Believing, as many do, that now the Tsar will overcome the difficulties, Fabergé designs two eggs to applaud the event. For the Tsarina, he paints an image of Nicholas consulting with his officers at the front. 
resting on the points of four miniature artillery shells, the steel military egg makes up in significance what it lacks in ornamentation. Fabergé had no more precious materials. Gold and silver were no longer allowed to be handled by jewelers at that time, so it was steel and brass and copper. The imperial family could also not be seen ordering expensive things uh, from Fabergés at the time when Russia was bleeding to death. The simple order of St. George egg given to the Dowager Empress Maria that year is another gesture to wartime austerity. Away from St. Petersburg supervising Red Cross activities in the South, she writes to her son. I thank you with all my heart for your lovely egg, which dear old Fabergé brought himself. It is beautiful. I wish you, my darling Nikia, all the best things and success in everything. Your fondly loving old mama. But Nicholas is unable to sustain the war effort against industrialized Germany. By 1917, famine threatens the country. Riots and strikes demanding bread are commonplace in Moscow and St. Petersburg. When the imperial troops join the demonstrators, the government collapses to the revolution. On March 15th, with neither the support of the people nor the aristocracy, Nicholas is forced to abdicate. The next day, the Tsar and his family are arrested and eventually removed to Siberia, where they are held captive for over a year. In the chilly pre-dawn hours of July 17, 1918, Nicholas and Alexandra, with their five children, Olga, Tatiana, Maria, Anastasia, and Alexei, are herded into a basement and executed. The Dowager Empress is quickly evacuated on a British cruiser. With her is the St. George Egg. Soon after, the contents of the Romanov palaces are confiscated. Most of the Fabergé eggs, along with masses of imperial gold, silver, jewels, and icons, are inventoried, packed in crates, and taken to the Kremlin armory. In 1918, the House of Fabergé is nationalized and ransacked. When Fabergé saw that all was lost, all of the members of the imperial family on Russian soil had been murdered, decided that that was it, that his whole world had collapsed, and he fled to Switzerland, where he died, I always say, of a broken heart. Lenin's efforts to preserve Russia's cultural heritage are undermined when Stalin comes to power in the 1920s. He begins trading the Russian imperial legacy for desperately needed Western currency to finance the new regime. Still so closely associated with the decadence of the Romanovs, Fabergé's eggs are initially undervalued. It takes several decades for them to regain recognition as magnificent works of art. The Winter Egg, the most expensive egg purchased by the Tsar, was acquired anonymously by an American businessman in 1994 at public auction for the record price of five and one half million dollars. Of the 50 imperial eggs made, only 10 remain in the Kremlin. Most others now reside in museums and private collections in Europe and the United States. Eight are still missing.
Fabergé's imperial Easter eggs endure as fragile mementos of the doomed Russian dynasty. Each not only an artistic masterpiece, but a reflection of the joys and achievements of a family at the crossroads of history. From exquisite design to the natural splendor of the largest blue diamond known to the world. It is the rarest of stones. But that's not the only thing about the Hope Diamond that fascinates the spoiled young heiress with a multi-million dollar fortune and a taste for jewelry, expensive jewelry. On holiday in Paris in 1911, Evelyn Walsh McLean and her husband Ned are at the Hotel Bristol, expecting a visit from the Prince of Jewelers himself, Pierre Cartier. Cartier came to call on us, carrying a package tightly closed with the wax seal. His manner was exquisitely mysterious. Cartier has sold exotic gems to Evelyn in the past, and he carries with him now a most exceptional stone. Hoping to capture the interest of his wealthy and eccentric young client, Cartier has prepared an unusual sales strategy. I brought with me a little something. You remember, madame, that when we last met, you told me of a great blue stone you had seen at the throat of the Sultan's favorite in a harem in Turkey. We hear since that the unfortunate woman was stabbed to death during the Turkish rebellion. I remembered that stone. And at that moment, my interest had been piqued. Only recently brought to auction in Paris. This diamond's history, as we believe it, begins in the 1600s, when a rather well-known merchant traveled the Orient in search of rare and precious gems. This merchant, by the name of Jean-Baptiste Tavernier, brought with him from India a large collection of jewels to sell to King Louis XIV, the extravagant Sun King of France. I am certain you must have heard of him, madame. Now, among Tavernier's jewels was a great blue diamond weighing about 112 carats. The Maharajas of India, oh, they preferred their diamonds very large, but King Louis was more interested in symmetry and brilliance than size. So Louis, he ordered the diamond to be recut into a heart shape that weighed about 67 carats. He wore it as a pendant and called it the French Blue. Well, he passed it on to Louis XV, of course. And in 1749, the new king had the stone set in an insignia piece for the Royal Order of the Golden Fleece. And this he wore with great pride. His son, King Louis XVI, was the next owner of the French Blue. And his infamous wife, Marie Antoinette, oh, she loved that diamond. But alas, in 1792, during the French Revolution, all the crown jewels, including that diamond, they were stolen from the royal treasury. Now, we do not know precisely what happened to the French blue after the revolution, but we think it must have been smuggled out of France. By this time, Cartier had me on fire with eagerness to see what treasure was sealed up in his package. But shrewd salesman that he was, he did not open it. He just went on talking. But we do know that in 1839, a blue diamond weighing over 45 and one half carats appeared in the collection catalog of Henry Phillips Hope, a most prominent London banker and diamond collector. Monsieur Hope, he called it the Hope Diamond, but he included no record of this diamond's pedigree in the catalog. We have come to believe, however, that a stone of such size and color could only have been cut from the French blue. It is a most unusual shade of blue. Evelyn could wait no longer. Let me see the thing, I said. Cartier breathed quietly without movement for a long moment. 
I suppose a Parisian jewel merchant who trades among the ultra-rich has to be more or less an actor. Finally, he stripped away the wrappings and held before our eyes the Hope Diamond. As we all stared at that diamond, Monsieur Cartier began to tell us things he did not vouch for. The Tavernier had stolen the gem from a Hindu idol and was cursed and torn apart by savage beasts. Since then, the diamond has brought bad luck to anyone who wore or even touched it. Louis XIV died a horrible death from gangrene. And we all know about the knife blade that sliced through Marie Antoinette's throat. Lord Hope's grandnephew and heir to the diamond had plenty of troubles. His wife eloped with handsome Captain Strong. Now maybe that was not bad luck, but it was embarrassing. Monsieur Cartier was most entertaining. I think myself that superstitions of the kind we speak about are baseless. Yet, one must admit they are amusing. Evelyn is enticed by the stories of mystery and intrigue, but her husband Ned is of a more practical nature and asks Cartier how much. But before Cartier could answer, I declared myself, Ned, I don't want the thing. I don't like the setting. And with that, Evelyn and Ned sail home to the United States. But it would not be the last Evelyn would hear from Cartier concerning the Hope Diamond. Pierre Cartier, being the really savvy jeweler that he was, he knew how to sell a diamond. And if not fabricate, at least greatly embellish its famous history. You know, people are so excited about this 350-year human history of the Hope Diamond. And what I like to try to remind them is that, in fact, the real history of the Hope Diamond began many, many years before that. In fact, perhaps as much as three billion years before it was ever seen by human eyes. Crystal clear diamonds are made of carbon, forged under tremendous heat and pressure about 100 miles below the Earth's surface. Colored diamonds are rare. When the Hope Diamond was forming deep within the Earth, there were a few impurities of boron atoms that happened to substitute in for some of these carbon atoms. And it's the light interacting with the boron atoms in the diamond structure that result in the blue color. In the absence of the French blue or any other contenders, the Hope Diamond is the largest and most perfect blue diamond in existence. Evelyn Walsh McLean is also one of a kind. She is the feisty daughter of an Irish immigrant who strikes gold, lots of gold, during the height of the rush for riches in the Wild West at the turn of the century. With his newfound wealth, Tom Walsh moves his family east to Washington, D.C. That was when everyone started coming to Washington who had money. It was a big thing then uh, to come to Washington and become a part of the, the national scene. And that's when all of these big houses were built. The Walsh Mansion on Massachusetts Avenue is the scene of some of the most lavish entertaining in Washington. It was considered the thing to do to come here and you would have three parties in one night, for heaven's sakes. Evelyn's tomboy days are over and her grooming as a debutante begins. An agreement was reached in our family for me to go to Paris to study music, French, and other parlor tricks of ladies. By some school magic, I was to become a lady. 
She was supposed to be set there to make a good match, you know. What she really did was to buy out the whole town of Paris with, you know, innumerable dresses from Worth and all of these places. Evelyn changes her wardrobe and hairdo with the days of the week. She returns home from one trip with an outrageous new look. And her father just hated it, and all the girls at school made fun of her. And the headmistress said, you just can't do that. And so her father said, well, what would it take to make you put your hair back like everybody else? And she said, jewelry. I cannot help it if I have a passion for jewels. The truth is, when I neglect to wear them, astute members of my family call in doctors. In 1908, she elopes against her family's best advice with the handsome heir to the Washington Post fortune, Edward Beale McLean. With $200,000 in pin money as a wedding gift from both families, the newlyweds sail off on a three-month honeymoon to Europe and the Mideast. At the end of the trip, Evelyn and Ned arrive in Paris without even enough money left to pay the hotel bill. So I cabled my father and he sent me fresh credit and his love. Then I went to Cartier's. That is the way I always get into trouble when I have some money in my hands. One month after their meeting at the Hotel Bristol, Pierre Cartier travels to Washington to visit the McLeans again. Recognizing the limited market for a jewel the size and character of the Hope Diamond, Cartier hopes his new strategy will clinch the deal. Cartier wanted a lot of money. And she said, well, I don't know. And he said, well, I've fixed it up now with a wonderful setting and you'll like it. Keep it for four days. And so she put it on her dresser and she looked at it and she looked at it. For hours, that jewel stared at me. At some time during the night, I began to want the thing. Then I put the chain around my neck and hooked my life to its destiny for good or evil. The deal closes at $180,000. Cartier's elaborate sales pitch has worked because for the young and impetuous heiress, the diamond's mysterious past is a hot selling point. But not everyone is as intrigued by the diamond. Evelyn's mother-in-law is particularly appalled. Mummy thought my buying that stone was a piece of recklessness. She said, it is a cursed stone and you must send it back before it ruins us all. I replied firmly, but Mummy, everybody has bad luck. You never know. Almost every day, Evelyn receives letters from strangers who know she now owns the Hope Diamond. They blame their association with it, however removed, for bad luck and ruin, and warn her against its evil powers. Still, Evelyn will not give up the hope. But when Mummy dies within the year, Evelyn decides not to take any chances and calls on the aid of a higher power. We went to the church of Monsignor Russell. Look, Father, I said to him, this thing has got me nervous. Would you bless it for me? He put my bauble on a velvet cushion, but as he began his blessings, a storm broke. Lightning flashed, thunder shook the church. I don't mind saying various things were scared right out of me.
Evelyn Walsh McLean herself loved to tell the stories. I mean, she promoted the heck out of the Hope Diamond. She lived the flamboyant lifestyle. She liked being in the spotlight. And the Hope Diamond was one way of keeping her in the spotlight. She just did some wonderful, bizarre things with the Hope Diamond. She would hide it behind her cushions and in her toaster. And, you know, she pawned it. And she would loan it to people to wear for their weddings. She wore it in swimming. She wore it one time she was having an operation, a serious operation. She wore it in a roller coaster, fishing in the icy north, just about every place you can imagine. She was supposed to have put it on her great name, that the great name would wear it around his collar. She liked to shock people. You know, she liked to surprise them. My own preference, generally, is for show. It is only when the thing I buy creates a show for those around me that I get my money's worth. Besides that, she thought that things that were unlucky for everybody else would be lucky for her because she was an exception. Over the next two decades, the McLeans live a charmed life, raising children, vacationing, and entertaining at their mansions in town and their country estate known as Friendship. No stranger to the rich and powerful of Washington's elite, Evelyn builds her reputation as the town's most flamboyant and exuberant hostess. Her parties are the talk of DC society. Invitations run into the thousands, including politicians, tycoons, celebrities, and dignitaries from around the world. And Evelyn spares no extravagance to show her guests a good time. For one party, she hires three orchestras, spends $48,000 on flowers alone, and adds an entire wing to friendship to accommodate the overflow crowd. Evelyn makes her appearances in the latest Paris fashions, and always she wears the Hope Diamond. Well, she had such a strong identification with the diamond. The diamond was the way that she portrayed herself to the world. I mean, you would see her across the room and know, that must be Evelyn Wash McLean, because that is the Hope Diamond. I like to wear my diamond as a charm and pretend it brings good luck to everyone around me. Evelyn has a heart of gold and a real concern for people in unfortunate circumstances. For instance, during World War II, she used to have veterans come to her house, particularly wounded veterans, and uh, she used to have parties in which people who had lost a leg or an arm or something like that, she would throw the Hope Diamond for them to catch with their new artificial limbs. She was not the world's most practical person, but she meant well. But in Washington, entertaining can be an expensive proposition, even for a millionaires. She hawked it a number of times because she was always running out of money. She was not one to, to manage her money. She just wanted to live in a certain way, and that's what it cost. Evelyn makes her good luck charm work for the good of others but it can't keep tragedy from her own back door. At the age of nine, her adored firstborn son, Vincent, is killed in an automobile accident. Her husband, Ned, runs off with another woman and dissipates their fortune. A chronic alcoholic, he eventually dies in a sanatorium. Their family newspaper goes bankrupt and Evelyn is forced to sell some of her properties. 
Then in 1946, Evelyn's daughter dies of an overdose of sleeping pills at the age of 25. With each misfortune, rumors of the Hope Diamond's curse resume. The curse is a, a fascinating part of the story of the Hope Diamond that has helped to make the diamond as famous as it is. But as a scientist, as a curator, uh, I don't believe in curses. For example, poor John Baptiste Tavernay, who supposedly after he sold the Hope Diamond was ripped apart by a pack of savage dogs. Well, Tavernay lived up to a very respectable old age. In fact, he made himself quite a fortune selling diamonds to French royalty. And people look at Marie Antoinette and say, well, here's another example of what happened to someone who had once worn this blue diamond. But the insignia of the royal order, the Golden Fleece, was a piece of jewelry that was only worn by the king for special ceremonial occasions, and so it would never have been worn by Marie Antoinette. Though it could be argued that King Louis had some bad luck, too. Even Sultan Abdul Hamid II, who owned the diamond before Cartier, was more likely to have lost the Ottoman Empire through bad management than the curse of the infamous diamond. Though notions persist that the diamond is responsible for her bad luck, Evelyn's own views on its legendary powers are more down to earth. What tragedies have befallen me might have occurred had I never seen or touched the Hope Diamond. My observations have persuaded me that tragedies, for anyone who lives, are not escapable. In 1947, Evelyn Walsh McLean dies. Her collection of jewelry, including the prized blue diamond, is sold to pay the debts of her estate. The new owner is New York jeweler Harry Winston. He sends the Hope Diamond on a nine-year goodwill tour of the United States to raise money for charity. As it travels, news reports are filled with the stories of its mysterious past. In 1958, Winston donates the diamond to the Smithsonian Institution in an effort to develop a major national gem collection for the American people. Today, the diamond resides in the Hall of Geology, Gems and Minerals, revolving sedately behind three inches of bulletproof glass in the new Harry Winston room. People are fascinated by anything that's considered to be rare and valuable. The Hope Diamond has become the most popular item in the entire Smithsonian Institution. But let's face it, if Evelyn Walsh McLean never owned the Hope Diamond, it's very unlikely that we would all be sitting here talking about the Hope Diamond right now. I would be trying hard to convince you that it's a wonderful natural history object and you should all come and see it, but it would probably not have the same cachet or the same fame as it does now. I think it was a case of wanting to have something that nobody else had. She couldn't have a crown, she couldn't have a very nice husband, but she sure could have the Hope Diamond. With an iron hand, determined to preserve the monarchy in the face of appeals for social reform. But after nearly 300 years of autocracy under the Romanov dynasty, Russian history is about to change. In 1894, the Tsar's health fails. He dies suddenly in the prime of life, and his son Nicholas unwillingly ascends the throne. My God, the Lord has called our deeply beloved Papa to him. My head is spinning. I am not prepared to be a czar. I never wanted to become one. Untrained in the business of ruling one-eighth of the world's population and purposely cut off from progressive thinking by his parents, 
Nicholas embraces the limited ideals of order and tradition. So to make sure that he didn't make any mistakes, he decided that the easiest course for him was to continue everything that his father had done. And he adored his father. He loved him very much. The decision applies as deliberately to the established customs within the court and family as to the affairs of state. And of course the Easter eggs was a tradition that was started by his father and Nicholas decided to carry it on. The 12 monograms egg is the first Fabergé egg given by Tsar Nicholas to his mother. Featuring in duck craftsmanship, Fabergé eagerly formulates a new aesthetic, which he hopes will capture the fancy of the Russian aristocracy. His feeling was that it should be creativity and, and craftsmanship rather than carrot content that dictated the appreciation of a piece. And he obviously had a wonderful sense of humor. And these caught the attention of Alexander III. And he admired these and admired the craftsmanship as examples of, of Russian genius. When the title of supplier to the court of his imperial majesty is bestowed on him in 1885, Fabergé's fame spreads throughout Europe. Once you're one of the approved suppliers to the crown, it was a very lucrative source of business. Every time the, the, the Tsar went on a visit or received another head of state, there was always an exchange of gifts. And when the Tsar and Tsarina traveled, they traveled with suitcases full of Fabergé, which were presented here and there to people in thanks. By 1896, the year of the coronation of Nicholas II, virtually all the major presents came from Fabergé. The novelty of combining artistic inspiration with functional value and a touch of whimsy is so successful that Fabergé's workshops are flooded with commissions, transforming an ordinary goldsmithing shop into the famous House of Fabergé. But though aristocrats, emperors, barons, kings and queens alike all cross his threshold seeking pseudopimons, the royal insignia of Tsar Alexander III, Fabergé's understated creation is a fitting tribute for the mourning dowager empress. That same year, Nicholas orders a second egg to be made for his bride, the German Princess Alexandra Fedorovna. For the new Tsarina, Fabergé trims a strawberry red egg with a diamond cupid's arrow. The surprise inside is a golden yellow rosebud, another symbol of the couple's love for one another. With the success of the rosebud egg, Fabergé turns his attention to an ambitious design for the following Easter. When Peter Carl Fabergé takes over his father's jewelry firm in 1872, it is not much different from several other workshops catering to the upper classes of St. Petersburg. But Fabergé is determined to distinguish the family name. Here uh, you see the shrewd man, the businessman. He worked for an institution called the Imperial Cabinet, which was in charge of all the treasures of the Tsars in the Hermitage. He worked there free of charge and repaired things, appraised things, and so on. Having earned the recognition of this prestigious organization by virtue of his consummate of the immediate family, only the Dowager Empress Maria Fedorovna would escape the assassin's bullet. As she makes a hasty departure from her homeland, she brings with her the last Fabergé Imperial Easter egg she will ever receive from her son Nicholas, once the Tsar of all the Russias. And halfway around the world, an eccentric young heiress becomes ensnared in the notorious past of the largest known blue diamond. I think it was a case of wanting to have something that nobody else had. 
She couldn't have a crown. She couldn't have uh, a very nice husband, but she sure could have the Hope Diamond. Easter is the most joyful celebration of the Orthodox faith in Russia. After the devout church services, families gather to exchange gifts of decorated eggs, symbols of renewed life and hope. This Easter of 1885 also marks the 20th anniversary of Tsar Alexander III and Tsarina Maria Fedorovna, and the Tsar needs an exceptional gift for his wife. So he places an order with Peter Carl Fabergé, whose beautiful jeweled creations have recently caught Maria's eye. On Easter morning, Fabergé delivers to the palace a simple enameled egg but to the delight of the Empress, inside is a golden yolk. And within the yolk, a golden hen. And concealed within the hen is a diamond miniature of the royal crown and a tiny ruby egg, both now lost to history. His wife's pleasure is all Tsar Alexander needs to reward Fabergé with a commission for an Easter egg every year. Each must be unique, and each must contain a suitable surprise for the Empress. With an inventive spirit, Fabergé repeatedly meets the challenge, borrowing inspiration from the gilded lives of the Tsar and Tsarina. In Russia, near the turn of the century, the contrast between the very rich and the very poor could not be more absolute. Over 80 million peasants scratch a meager existence from the land. In the city's developing industries, working conditions are intolerable. While democratic freedoms take hold elsewhere in Europe, no constitutional restraints limit the power of the Tsar, who rules by divine right. A great big bear of a man, Alexander III governs what